Hey guys, Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to another virtual lecture. In today's video, we're going to learn more about banks and how they create money. In particular, they use the fractional reserve system to do so. Now, before that, let's take a look at why are banks important in the study of money. Banks are important in the study of money because, number one, they provide a channel for linking people who want to save with those who want to borrow. Okay, so we deposit our money because we want to, well, keep our money safe. Remember the story of the goldsmith? Yeah, so we're those people who keep our so-called banknotes or money in the banks. And there are also those who want to borrow. Maybe they want to use it for a business expansion or for whatever reason. Another reason why banks are important in the study of money is because banks can influence the level of money supply as well as transmitting the effects of monetary policy to the economy. Later on, we will see how banks do this, okay? Thirdly, banks are also important because they are the source of rapid financial innovation. These days, there are just so many financial tools and instruments that can be used by all of us in order to make investments or savings and whatnot, okay? So now let's move on to learning how banks make profits. So banks, guys, are a business, okay? So just like any business, their main objective is to make profits, all right? So as you can see here, banks are profit-making institutions, but the profits are called earning spread. So how these profits are made is very simple. If you can visualize the situation, here we have the banks, and there are basically two parties. One is the savers, and one are the borrowers okay so this the savers deposit money into the banks right so this is basically us we deposit money into the banks and then the banks will give out loans to the borrowers okay from the loans that these borrowers get from the banks okay so the borrowers need to pay back the bank's interest on the loans and banks need to repay or to give out dividends or interest on the deposit to the savers. So from this simple visual, um, we can see that in order for the banks to uh, get their earnings spread, it's the difference between the interest received from the loans and the interest paid on deposit. So this is the difference here is the oops, earning spread or the bank's profit. So just like any profit-making institution, the banks want to maximize their profits. So what they want to do is they want to give out as much loans as possible to as many borrowers as possible. And uh, of course, uh, when they get a lot of this, minus the amount of dividends that, that they need to pay out for us, then that way they will maximize their profits. However, this practice is dangerous, okay, because... During recession especially, non-performing loans would increase, meaning that people may have trouble paying back their loans, okay, because well, it's bad times. In bad times, that's what happens. People may be losing jobs, they don't have enough money for themselves, so of course, they end up maybe defaulting loans and not paying back. Therefore, the banks do not have enough funds, right, to meet the cash demanded by depositors. This will create financial panic. So as a result, the government steps in, Okay, to avoid this financial panic, the central bank in any country, ours is Benagara, imposed that every bank has to have this reserve requirement to enhance the liquidity of banks and to protect depositors. Okay, so the objective of this reserve requirement is to prevent banks from overextending or underextending bank credit. Okay, so now let's learn some terminologies. As mentioned here before, um, every bank has a reserve requirement to meet. That is, they have to enhance their liquidity and to protect their depositors, right? So because of that, reserve requirement is basically the minimum percent of deposits that banks must hold in reserve at the central bank. Okay, so usually the banks keep more cash and deposits than what's required for them for their own precaution as well, okay? And then we have your reserve ratio, which is the percent of the deposits that a bank must hold in reserve. You can see from the formula here. In other words, this is the total amount of reserve that's required to be saved by the commercial banks, divided by the total deposits that they have. So times 100, you get the percentage, right? And then we have the excess reserve. As mentioned here just now, banks usually keep more, right, in reserve. So 
um, you just take the difference between their actual reserves and the amount that's uh, required. So we will have their excess reserve. Oh, sorry, there's a typo here. Required. Okay, let's take a look at this formula again. The required reserve is basically the amount of reserves that the bank must deposit with the central bank to meet the legal reserve requirement divided by the bank's total deposits. Okay, so this would make up what is the required reserve. So whatever it is that the bank actually keeps as reserve, because we know that the bank normally keeps more than required, so their actual reserves minus the required reserve, they will have the bank's excess reserves. So how does the fractional reserve system create money? Well, as mentioned to you before, banks are only required to keep a fraction or part of their deposits in reserve, which means they have the rest of the deposits to lend out to other people. So basically, that's how banks create money. Now, I'm going to give you an example to understand this concept further. But before that, you need to remember one very important thing, okay? So commercial banks, okay, they create money by giving out loans. Okay, remember that. It's very important. Money is being created when banks give out loans. Therefore, the opposite is true, meaning when people pay back their loans, money is destroyed. Okay. To continue our example of the fractional reserve system and how it works, um, several assumptions have to be made. Number one, the reserve requirement imposed by the central bank on all commercial banks is 10%. Okay. Secondly, the initial condition is the same for all banks. That is, every bank will have the initial deposit of 1,000 ringgit. Thirdly, banks will lend out all of their excess reserves. In other words, there's zero excess reserves. And fourthly, checks are drawn for the entire amount of loan and cleared against another bank. Okay, so these examples are quite exaggerated because we want to really show the effect or how the fractional reserve system uh, create money. In other words, how this um, system caused the multiple expansion of bank credit. Okay, guys, I'm going to show you a series of accounts, okay, and to save time, I've already written them down in advance, okay, so I'll try to explain them as best as possible, so if you're having any problems to follow, you can just, you know, pause the video and uh, repeat. Okay, let's say this is the initial condition, meaning the very first condition for bank A. As mentioned to you just now, if you look back at the uh, assumption made, number one, Initial condition is the same for all banks, right? Which means every bank will have an initial deposit of 1,000 ringgit. That is why here the total deposit for bank A is 1,000. Okay, this is true for all banks in our example. Now remember, the reserve requirement imposed by the central bank is 10%. What that means is, out of the total deposit, 10% has to go to the required reserve. See, I've shown the working here. So 100 goes to the required reserve, meaning 100 ringgit from bank A goes to the central bank. Now you can see that there's going to be a balance in favor because here's 1,000 and if you've learned accounting, it has to be balanced, 1,000 and 1,000. And here's 100, which means 900 is available to give out as loans, okay? So this is basically uh, the balancing figure. So now suppose we have the first individual, which is Abu. Let's say Abu deposits 100 into bank A. So what happens? 100 plus 1,000, so we'll have 1,100. So meaning we have to change our account a bit. There you go. Right, so this is what happens to bank A after Ali, sorry, after Abu deposits his 100, yeah? The total deposit of bank A becomes 1,100. So that means there must also be a change, right, in the required reserve. 10% of 1,100 is 110. Okay, so just now the loan is 900. So the balancing figure is 90. Okay, again, I repeat, how do we get 90? It's 1,100 minus 100. And 10 minus 900, which is from the previous figure, so we'll have 90. 90 is basically the balancing figure, or in other words, it's the excess reserve. Okay, the difference between the actual and the required reserve. Okay, so we have 90 here. But now remember, another assumption was banks are all loaned out. What that means is banks should not have any excess reserves. So what that means is this 90 can be um, transferred into loans okay so now meaning bank a has a total of 990 ringgit available to give out as loans so moving on okay there you go 
Right, the bank A can lend out an additional 90 ringgit because excess reserve should be zero. Okay, let's say we've got the second individual in the story, which is Amina. So now let's say Amina borrows that 90 from bank A, okay? So how does the account look like? Here we go. So now this is what account, uh, what bank A's account look like after lending out that additional 90 ringgit to Amina. Total deposit is still 1,100. Required reserve is still 110, but as you can see here, the excess reserves become zero because 90 ringgit was lent out to Amina, so it becomes here. Okay, so it's um, included in the loan account. All right, now remember the other assumption, banks are drawn for the entire amount of loan and cleared against another bank. So uh, what we're going to show is, okay, since Amina borrows 90 ringgit from bank A, Amina will use... Okay, we'll use this 90 ringgit loan to write a check to the supermarket. So I guess Amina bought some stuffs from the supermarket. And instead of paying cash, Amina writes a check to the supermarket, okay? So what happened is the supermarket will then accept that check from Amina and deposits to its bank. Now, the supermarket has its own bank, which is called Bank B. So here we're going to look at the account for Bank B. Remember, the initial condition for all banks is the same, meaning um, initially the total deposit is 1,000, right? But since the supermarket deposits 90 ringgit into the bank B, that is why we have here total deposit 1,090. Okay, remember 1,000 initial condition plus 90 that the supermarket got from Amina, okay? That is why the total deposit here is 1,090. And as usual, we calculate the required reserve. 10% of whatever deposit that the bank has, 109, goes to the central bank. And um, the remaining, 1090 minus 109, okay, is uh, then minus 900, which is loan. Okay, how do we get this 900 again? Remember, the initial condition was total deposit is 1000. So whenever, um, to explain this 900, let's just go back to this initial condition. This is how we get the original or the initial loan amount of 900. Let's just go back down here. Okay. So the balancing figure, 1090 minus 109 minus 900, we get 81. So in this case for bank B, its excess reserve is 81 ringgit. And remember the assumption, banks must lend out all of the excess reserves. So this um, 81 is what bank B has available to lend out. Moving on with our example. So since bank B now has an additional... 81 ringgit to lend out, let's say after lending it, okay, I've run out of people to come up with, but let's say Bank B manages to lend out its 81 ringgit to somebody, that, um, see, the excess reserve here becomes zero because the 81 goes into this loan account, okay? So, oh yeah, it's finally Ali, yeah. So suppose that other person, Ali, borrows from Bank B, that 81 ringgit, and deposits to another person's account. Okay, in bank C. So the bank C's account will look like this. Okay, the bank C's account, first of all, it started off with 1,000, right? Remember, every bank has the same initial condition. So initially, bank C has a total deposit 1,000. So the required reserve is 100 and the loan here is 900 as usual. But then because uh, the depositor deposited 81 ringgit to bank C, that's why it becomes 1081. Therefore, the required reserve uh, from bank C to the central bank becomes 108.1, okay? So 1081 minus 900 minus 108.1, we will have here actually 72 ringgit and 90 cent. But remember the assumption, all excess reserves will be lent out. That is why in the end, so it becomes zero and that 72.90 goes into the total loans account. So as you can see here, the process can continue so on and so forth. As long as there's excess reserve, the subsequent banks will keep on lending it out. And if you noticed, the excess reserves become smaller and smaller, isn't it? So now let's look back. Okay, initially our excess reserve first was 90, and then it was um, 81, and then now it's 72, 90. So as you can see, if you have the time, you can you know keep on going, you can see that the excess reserves become smaller and smaller until eventually uh, it runs out. So the money supply will continue to expand until there's no more excess reserves left in the banking system. 
So as you can see, on the basis of only 90 ringgit in excess reserve, you know, the first uh, excess reserve that went out. Okay, so the entire banking system is able to lend out 900 ringgit. So remember, whenever the bank lends out money, money is being created. Okay, so this is what happens before. Okay, remember, bank A created 90 ringgit worth of loan. Bank B created 81 ringgit. And then bank C, 72.90. If you have time, you can do bank D, E, F, G, and so on and so forth. You can see here, the amount of excess reserves um, diminishes, of course. Uh, but anyway, overall, the total amount of excess reserves being able to lend out is 900. Okay, so there's actually a shortcut in order to get this 900. You don't really need to make all of those accounts. Okay, so the shortcut is known as the money multiplier. Okay, so this concept is very important for us to understand how money supply uh, grows in the economy. So money multiplier or M is basically one over the required reserve ratio. Okay, so this amount is given in the question just now, which is 10%, all right? So 1 over R is M. Okay, so we go back to our example just now. What is the money multiplier in this case? Remember, it's 1 over R. So we know R is 10%, which is 0 0.1. So our money multiplier is 10. So remember, um, to know or to get the total amount of, or, or the maximum amount of money being created, which is D. Okay, D is the demand deposit created. Remember, whenever the banks give out loans, to people, people will automatically create loan accounts, right? So those money are being put in those accounts, so it becomes their demand deposit. Okay, so demand deposit is equals to the the first excess reserve multiplied with a multiplier. So our first excess reserve just now was 90 ringgit, right? Which bank A gives out as loan. 90 times 10, so here's how we get 900. So this is the shortcut, okay? This is how we get the total amount of money being created in this uh, money market, okay? So how is this money created? Through the fractional um, reserve system. Okay, I'm zooming out so you can see all of the important formulas to be used in this topic. One is the money multiplier, one over R. Once you get the money multiplier, you can use it here to get um, the maximum amount of money being created in the market, okay? So D, which D here is the checkable deposits. Remember when we studied the supply of money, we have M1, M2, and M3. So M1 consists of currency and current accounts, right? Or demand deposit. So that's where D1 here is. Okay, so E times M. E here is the first excess reserve, all right? Times the money multiplier. So you'll be able to get the total amount or maximum amount of money being created through the fractional reserve system. So how much can money be created? Well, it depends on several factors. So here we, you can see this is the, the factors that affect the extent of the multiplier, okay? So number one, it depends on the reserve requirement ratio, obviously. As you can see, the formula is M is one over R, right? So the higher the reserve requirement ratio, the lesser would be the multiplier. So the lesser the multiplier, the lesser will be the creation of money. Alternatively, if the R is lowered, okay, therefore we'll have higher multiplier, so there will be more creation of money. And of course, the multiplier also depends on the efficiency of the banking system. Now, this one cannot be um, observed in lecture notes, so you can, you can actually see this in reality, how if effective and how efficient the banking system is. The more efficient the banking system, the more money is being, it can be created more uh, faster, right? And of course, here, the extent of the multiplier also depends on the extensiveness of the banking system, uh, meaning the more people have deposits, the more people have bank accounts, then of course, the creation of money can be more. And finally, do remember that the process is reversible, meaning that um, just as the banks can create, quote unquote, money uh, by making loans, whenever people repay back their loans, money is being destroyed.